Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all here tonight. I'm Lori Bergen, and I'm the founding dean of the new College of Media, Communication, and Information at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm very excited to welcome you to an exciting evening with Thomas Frank. And while I'm delighted that all of you are here, I want to give a special shout out and welcome to one of our regents who's with us tonight, Steve Bosley, who is a proud CU alumnus and has served the residents of Colorado since 2004 as a member of the Board of Regents. So let's give him a welcome. Thank you. As a university, I think you know we are devoted to providing a space for a robust exchange of ideas across the political spectrum. And in that spirit, the new College of Media Communication and Information and our new first year course, which is called Concepts and Creativity, we've partnered tonight with the Center for Western Civilization, Thought, and Policy and with our own Boulder Talk Center in a lecture series devoted to discussing the current political climate in America in this election year. Now, on November 14th, just a week after the election, We'll be bringing blogger and Fox News host Megan McCain to campus to offer her insights on the election. But tonight we are fortunate to host my fellow Kansan, Tom Frank, who's been to my hometown, Salina, and has had burgers from the Cozy Inn, so he's got a lot going for him tonight. Those of you who've been there know. But he is one of the most important progressive voices that we have writing about American politics and culture today. So we're really delighted that he's here with us tonight. But to introduce Thomas Frank, I'd like to turn uh, the microphone over to Professor Pete Simonson from our Department of Communication. Pete teaches the conversation module of our first year concepts and creativity course. He conducts research on rhetorical practice across different media, the intellectual history of communication in the US, and the international history of media and communication studies. So ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming Pete Simonson. How does that big voice? Um, and sorry, I'm the second Kansan tonight, which is probably one Kansan too many. I could be the one that's gotten rid of, but thank you very much, Lori. Um, and before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to thank members of three groups who have made tonight possible, three groups, all of whom are committed to uh, expanding the possibility for public discussion on campus and around the community in the front range. The first is the College of Media Communication and Information. We're just in our second year right now, uh, headed by our terrific Dean Lori Bergen, who you just saw from. Uh, Dean Bergen, a year ago, when I proposed the possibility of having a lecture series across the political spectrum this fall, graciously and generously offered to support that um, with both her uh, money and with her uh, energy and support. So thank you to Dean Bergen from CMCI. Also from CMCI, my colleague Rick Stevens over here who teaches in the fall with me. We have two modules, conversation and storytelling, try to give our students the opportunity to learn new ideas, hands-on skills, and to engage in public conversations like the one we are working on tonight. Uh, Professor Nabil Chaibi, Nabil Chaibi today uh, hosted a lunchtime conversation uh, that Thomas Frank generously offered to take part in, talking about the possibility of public engagement through media. We have an active graduate program involved in that now. And so thanks to Nabil for making that possible. And then also Melinda Miller and Christy Graham Gitkin made this audience possible uh, in getting the word out and, and helping to support there. So number one, thanks to CMCI. Number two, uh, thanks to the College of Arts and Sciences. This is a collaborative evening tonight and the College of Arts and Sciences, in particular the Center for Western Civilization, Thought and Policy, led by uh, my colleague Bob Paz now over here, have also kicked in generously with money and support to make this series possible. So thanks to Bob um, and his terrific uh, assistant, Alex Holmgren. Clint Talbot, also from, assist from Arts and Sciences, helped out um, with publicity as well. Third, we have a new center here in uh, CMCI called Boulder Talks that is engaged in helping to uh, promote a robust democratic uh, discourse in the local level and broader and Boulder Talks and, and their great associate uh, director, Jeff Motter, was also a big help. 
Finally, I'd like to give a shout out to the uh, CU College Democrats who were sponsors of this tonight as well, and uh, many of them are here tonight. And I'd like to thank uh, over here to my left, Tom Frank, for being so uh, incredibly generous with his time here. A lot of times when you bring in a speaker of Tom's stature, they're in and out. Um, Tom has done multiple events from the fall, from the lunch conversation today, the public lecture tonight, and he's going to be visiting uh, both Rick and my class tomorrow, so our students are going to get a chance to interact with uh, you know, a, a leading intellectual and, and media figure. So thanks to Tom for that. Um, second preliminary, we are a college of media and we will engage in both new and older media tonight. Um, during the question and answer period, we are going to take some questions via Twitter. And so that will be um, organized and uh, chosen from by my colleague Rick over here. The hashtag is FrankListen. And so if you have a question and want to tweet it, um, that will come up to Rick's screen here, and he'll select some that Tom will respond to. We also are into old media from the spoken word to the written word. So if you're not at Twitter, we'll have uh, index cards, and we'll take questions uh, by the old scribal hand, and they too will come up to Rick. So we want to have participation from the audience. The other thing, uh, one of the oldest media, but also a really important one, the book. And uh, Tom's new book, Listen Liberal, is being sold outside uh, the hallway uh, in addition to What's the Matter with Kansas. And Tom will sign copies of that afterwards. So if you'd like to get a copy signed by the author, there will be that possibility. So that said, um, over the last two decades, Tom Frank has established himself as one of the really important social and political critics writing today. In the process, he has helped to show some of the possibilities of being a public intellectual in the current media environment. Writing for an engaged public audience and helping us all to think better in the process. Tom took his PhD in history from the University of Chicago in 1994. Three years later, he published the first of his eight books, The Conquest of Cool which detailed how the advertising industry successfully appropriated elements of the 1960s counterculture. That book won him widespread praise, with the New York Times calling him, quote, perhaps the most provocative young cultural critic of the moment, heady stuff. Since that time, across seven other books and scores of articles and columns, Tom has brought history together with economic, cultural, and political analysis and intellectual journalism to cast a scorching, sometimes tragic, and consistently witty and humorous light on populism, conservatism, class, and the contradictions of our age. He gained huge following with the 2004 bestseller, What's the Matter with Kansas, on sale tonight. With his latest book, Listen Liberal, he turns full bore to the Democratic Party and brings some tough love to progressives. In addition to showing how well-researched books can be widely read, important, and a lot of fun to read, Tom was also the founding editor of the Baffler magazine. He's been a columnist for Harper's Magazine, for Salon, and for the Wall Street Journal, where, as he told us uh, this afternoon at lunch, uh, he wore a flak jacket as the only liberal on the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal. Tom is also a frequent contributor to The Guardian and a number of other European news outlets, in addition to making regular appearances on American TV and radio. In sum, I'd say that Tom brings the best of a historian's trade. He throws the present into historical context so we can understand where we came from and the contours of the moment. He brings the best of a social critic and that he attends to economics, he attends to institutions, and he attends to the cultural ideas that we all think with. He brings the best of the journalist in being a marvelous prose stylist whose eloquence and well-chosen example often captures the whole story in a nutshell. Uh, and he brings the best of being a Kansan in both working from common sense and being critical of it and being able to sniff out BS in all its forms. So with that, I am delighted to present you Tom Frank. Oh, thank you, Pete. 
So I'm Kansan number three tonight. <laughs> and then later we'll open, we'll open it up to all the other Kansans here. All right. Um, so listen, folks. Um, look, I want to start by talking about the current political situation that we're in. And by current, I mean immediately, like what's happening right now. And the way things stand right now, there is a decent chance that this guy, Donald Trump, is going to be our next president. I mean, this is something that was... Um, Inconceivable a year ago. I mean, uh, think about who this guy is, right? He is the unlikeliest presidential candidate, I think, of my lifetime, maybe of all time. This is a man with uh, no political experience who thinks that the way you run for the presidency is you go down the list of, you know, different demographic groups and insult them each in turn. And he, he talks constantly about representing working Americans, but himself knows very little about their situation since, of course, he comes from the most exalted reaches of the plutocracy uh, and, in fact, became famous firing people on TV. That's what he used to do. He is profoundly, this is the weird thing, he's profoundly unpopular. He's hated even by many Americans. In fact, the only reason he has a chance to win is because the Democratic candidate is hated as well. Okay, now think about that for a second. This is crazy. We have the two most unpopular presidential candidates in recorded history running one against the other, right? Now what, think about that. What, what are the chances of that? Not just one party nominating a profoundly unpopular candidate, like, you know, in 1964, but both of them doing it simultaneously. And both of the parties running, uh, you know, these entirely negative campaigns, right? The Democrats say, vote for uh, Hillary, because you don't, you can't have Donald Trump as president. That's unthinkable. And the Republicans, you know, shout, lock her up! Lock her up! Now, just to make this picture even stranger, the families of these two candidates are personal friends, right? Chelsea and Ivanka and uh, the Donald and Bill, you know, uh, Tom catting around. <laughs> Do you see these pictures of these guys? I mean, these guys are pals. It's crazy. You know, the public hates both of them, and they're good friends with each other. But that's, you know, where the, the similarities end. You think about it. So one of these two uh, very unpopular candidates was the more or less unanimous choice of her party's established apparatus, while Donald Trump, of, of course, went against the Republican hierarchy all the way. Hillary Clinton is a longtime Washington professional. She knows the ropes. She knows how things work. She was Secretary of State, for Pete's sake, United States Senator. She was First Lady all through the 1990s. Uh, Trump seems to have no idea really how it works, isn't even really sure what's in the Constitution and what isn't. Um, you know, Hillary is so you know, polished, takes these you know, great pains to never offend anybody. Uh, Trump does nothing but offend. That's sort of his, his strategy, right? Hillary knows all about how a political campaign is run, how you reach out to this group and you court to that group and you, uh, you, know, you focus on the swing states and you do your micro-targeting and your big data and you, you have your ground game and you, you know, your get out the vote effort and you drive people to the polls on election day and all, you know, all of that sort of conventional stuff. And Trump seems to have no idea about any of this. It's just say whatever comes to mind. It's all some kind of, you know, it's, it's like this, the Facebook feed of his mind, right? And, and, you know, we just room one idea after another, and they just go, you know, uh, flashing by. It's all some kind of celebrity showdown, you know, where, where the results are going to be determined by everyone dialing in 1-800-make-me-president or something like that. But, folks, by all rights, this should be a blowout. It should not be close. It should be a landslide in the making. And yet it is. I just was on my way over here, checked... Uh, my email, and it is with it. It's five points. It's a five point race. And I still can't get over the fact that Donald Trump is going to win any state at all. Like, Kansas is going to go for him, for sure. No question about it. And that is, that, I, I just can't believe that, right? Let alone that he might win the whole thing. And now, weirdest of all, the reason that he is doing so well is because, now remember, this is a billionaire who's famous for firing people. The, the reason he's doing so well is because he's winning the enthusiastic support of the white working class, a demographic group that is watching its way of life crumble before its eyes. Now, 
Once upon a time, the white working class was democratic. I mean, not just democratic, profoundly democratic, right? The needs and desires of working class people were what made the Democratic Party what it was. This is why you had a Democratic Party, that, to serve working class people. This is why you had a New Deal. This is why Franklin Roosevelt was elected president four times in a row. And now they're lining up with this billionaire who's famous for firing people. Now, how the hell did this come to pass? This very unusual situation. But, you know, okay, let me uh, state that question a little differently. How is it that so many working class Americans decided to support this guy? How did the Democrats lose the favor of this essential group? Okay, that's really the question here. How did they go from the loyalty, from, from enlisting in one side of our political war to enlisting in the other? How did this happen? I want to suggest tonight that the degree to which the Republicans have won these voters over is the same degree to which the Democrats have abandoned them. And that's why I think that this is the year to ask whatever happened to the party of the people. Now, I mean this question in two different ways. First of all, how did the Democrats come to abandon this group, uh, working people, the great middle class of this country? And a related point, how is it that Democrats have failed to respond to the greatest issue of our time? What uh, issue am I talking to? What failure am I talking about? Well, President Obama himself, and I agree with him, has said that inequality is the defining challenge of our time. And that is a sweeping statement. By the way, President Obama, an honorary Kansan, <laughs> you know, he, he rarely goes there, but he, he's got the Kansan in him. You can see it. But, uh, but <laughs> when he said that, that inequality is the defining challenge of our time, it's a, it, yes, it's a sweeping statement, but you think about it for more than a few seconds and you realize it isn't anywhere near sweeping enough. I mean, inequality, think about this word. It is, I don't really like the term. It makes all our problems sound very technical, like they can be solved by economists back in D.C. if they just twist the dials the right way or something like that. But, it, you know, it's the word that we have, so let's use it. What does it mean? Inequality. It's a kind of shorthand for all the things that have gone to make the lives of the rich so much more delicious year on year for three decades now, and also at the same time for all the things that have gone to make the lives of working people so wretched and so precarious. Inequality is visible in the always rising cost of health care and college, in the coronation of Wall Street and the slow blighting of so many parts of this country. You catch a glimpse of inequality every time you hear about someone that had to declare bankruptcy because one of their kids got sick. Or when you read about the lobbying industry that drives Washington, D.C., where I live these days. Or when you hear about the requirement, the new constitutional requirement, apparently, that our presidential candidates either have to be billionaires' favorites or billionaires themselves. Inequality is about the way that speculators and even criminals get a helping hand from Uncle Sam while the Vietnam vet who lives down the street from you loses his house. Inequality is the reason that some people find such you know, incredible significance in the ceiling height of an entrance foyer for the hop content of a beer, while other people will never believe in anything again. Inequality, folks, is a euphemism for the Appalachification of our world. Now, I am well aware that it is the Republican Party that bears primary responsibility for the modern plutocracy that has built up around us. And I've written about this for years. This is, you know, the Republicans are the party that launched us on our modern era of tax cutting and wage suppressing. These are the people that made a religion out of the market and fought so ferociously to open up our politics to the influence of money at every level. I know this. But listen, folks, just blaming the Republicans one more time, turning the old TV set back to MSNBC, 
This is not good enough, folks. Not any longer. Because the things that I just described represent a failure of the Democratic Party as well. Look, protecting the middle class society, this used to be the Democrats' uh, prime directive, right? This was the mission. And once upon a time, you, you know, you take a guy like Harry Truman or Lyndon Johnson and put him in the situation that we have today, and they would have known exactly what to do about it. Now, I know that those old-time Democrats were screwed up in all sorts of ways, and they did lots of things wrong. But one thing they were really, really good at doing was defending the middle-class society. That's what they were all about. And look, it's true that to this day, Democrats still pay lip service to the ideal. Uh, you know, they are, they're always pledging to raise the minimum wage and raise the taxes of the rich. But when it comes to defining what Obama calls the defining challenge of our time, when it comes to taking on that challenge, many of our modern democratic leaders falter. And, you know, they acknowledge that inequality is rampant, it's out of control, and it's really awful, and they cry great big hot tears about it, right? But they can never find the conviction or the imagination to do what is necessary to reverse the situation. And, and so instead, they offer us the same high-minded policy platitudes that they've been selling since the 1980s, right? They tell us there's nothing anybody can do about globalization or technology, right? Those things are the hand of God reaching down into human affairs. There's no way you can, there's nothing you can do about globalization, right? And so they say, well, you know, there's the only things you can do. You can, they, they promise us charter schools, and more job training. Oh, and they'll shovel out the student loans, right? But other than that, folks, they got nothing. I want to uh, start tonight with the issue of the Wall Street bailouts back in 2008 and 2009. Because I think that is that's the most, uh, still to this day, the most important issue of our young century. That was the inflection point where everything could have changed. You know, where the entire system, where the, you know, the, the, the train could have been switched onto a different track and the country could have easily changed course. Uh, but our leaders chose not to. Okay? So let's talk about this. Let's remember what it was like back then. Uh, Eight years ago now, a different election was underway, and President Barack Obama was elected in this massive wave of hope and enthusiasm. Uh, right? You remember the gigantic rallies, hundreds of thousands of people in Kansas City. When he was sworn in, there were a million people on the mall in D.C., the most they've, they've ever had. And then he proceeded to continue the policies of President Bush, essentially unchanged, as regards to Wall Street banks. Right? Uh, no big banks got put into receivership. None of the uh, bailouts were unwound. No elite bankers were prosecuted. To this day, none of them were prosecuted. Uh, and so what I'm saying is that Obama and his Democrats refused to change course at that inflection point, at that moment when all the signs were telling them to turn, when it would have been good policy to turn, when it would have been overwhelmingly popular to turn. In fact, the country was behind him. Everyone expected President Obama to turn, including the Wall Street bankers themselves. You remember that moment when they were, they came down to Washington, right? And they were so ashen-faced. They were sure he was going to take them to the woodshed. And it was also, never forget, it was fully within President Obama's power at that moment to steer the country in a different direction. Okay? So what I'm saying is that on this essential issue of our time, there was no conflict between pragmatism and idealism. In the Democratic primary this year, we heard all about the, you know, the great divide between pragmatism, meaning Hillary, and idealism, meaning Bernie Sanders. But on this issue, there was no such divide. The idealistic thing was also the practical thing. And it was the healthful thing. It would have been good for the country. And it was also the popular thing. The country was behind him. The country fully expected it. And the president chose not to do it. Now, I know that in the grand sweep of the last 50 years or so, the Democrats are the good guys in the story, or rather the less bad guys. 
But it is not a coincidence, folks, that nearly all of the economic gains of the recovery, and this is a recovery, remember, presided over by a Democratic president, a man that we're often told is the most liberal possible Democrat that we will ever see in our lifetimes, that all the gains of this recovery went to the already wealthy. Okay? And this is not, or I should say not only, because sinister Republicans in Congress are constantly thwarting the righteous liberal will. Yes, I know that Republicans are awful and they play the game in a very serious way and they're very good at obstruction. But what I am describing here is straight up democratic failure. Okay? Barack Obama played this issue of the Wall Street banks the way he did because that's how he wanted to play it. And we have to acknowledge that as citizens, I think. Now, earlier I called this a failure. But you know what it really is. This is a betrayal. And the history of this betrayal goes back a long way. It doesn't start with Barack Obama. When I was young, when I was a kid, I remember reading the newspapers uh, you know, in the 1970s and the 1980s. And the Democratic Party was forever uh, grappling with its identity with these different factions in the Democratic Party arguing over who they were and what they stood for. And it went on for years, right? You had all of these different factions fighting like cats and dogs. But here's the crazy thing. No matter what the issues were that they disagreed on, they all came together on one thing. They all agreed that Democrats had to turn away from the legacy of the New Deal with its fixation on working class people. Okay? All the different reform elements of the Democratic Party agreed on this, had to turn away from the New Deal. Now, the man who brought closure to that uh, long democratic civil war was, of course, President Bill Clinton, who uh, brought a new kind of democratic administration to Washington, D.C. And I think that if we want to understand what has gone wrong in the last couple of years, this is the period that we have to go back and look at. The, uh, you know, if we want to understand uh, where the Democratic Party went off course, you have to look at the, Clinton, the Bill Clinton administration. Because, okay, so Clinton comes to Washington, and rather than doing what every Democrat before him had done, which is pay homage to the politics of Franklin Roosevelt, Clinton did the opposite. He did these kind of singular and conspicuous favors to Roosevelt's enemies, to the banks, to the radio networks, to the power companies, to the bosses, basically. He uh, deregulated Wall Street, as we all know. But it, what we don't often realize is that, it, it, in, I mean, I'm older than most of you guys. If you remember back to the 1990s, it wasn't one deregulatory measure. He did many, many, many. There's a whole series of them all through his administration, deregulating the banks. He, uh, among other, other things, ensured that derivative securities would be traded without uh, any kind of supervision. He deregulated radio, uh, deregulated the telecoms. He basically put an end to the federal welfare system. Uh, what it's one of the only big New Deal programs that has been essentially canceled. Uh, and that was Clinton that did it. Well, something that he did that a lot of people don't know um, is that in 1997, he arrived at a secret deal with Newt Gingrich, the Speaker of the House, to uh, partially privatize Social Security. They you know, had this series of secret meetings. It's not secret anymore. It's known now. It's been uh, written about in a couple of different, couple of different places. Um, but they, they had a, a series of secret meetings. Uh, Gingrich had the votes. Clinton was willing to sign it. They had the deal. The deal was ready to go. They had a timetable all worked out. Clinton would introduce uh, the privatization scheme, and they would you know, pass it during the lame duck session in 1998 or something like that. I forget what it Anyhow. Uh, it got derailed because the day after, or was it the day after? It was right around the time that Clinton gave the State of the Union speech introducing this plan. The Monica Lewinsky scandal happened, and that was the end of it. And it was, <laughs> you know, and so we still have Social Security, thanks to her. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite serious, you know. She's, uh, she's kind of a hero, um, if you think about it. <clears throat> Now, Clinton uh, had this very interesting, if you go back and look at the, uh, the, the race of 1992 when he first ran for president, he had this strategy as a candidate where he would go out of his way to insult or distance himself from some traditional Democratic constituency 
and in this way assure the public that he was his own man, he was beholden to no one. Uh, and the most famous example of this is when he contrived to insult Jesse Jackson to his face while the cameras rolled. I don't know if you remember this, it was called the Sister Soldier moment. It's pretty much forgotten, except for the, the fact that he was able to do this to Jesse Jackson. But the, the important thing was that in the sort of Clint, Clintonian uh, mind, right, in the, the, the Clintonian um, uh, uh, idea, the, I should say the popular phrase of the time, you could do whatever you wanted to groups like that because they had nowhere else to go. Do you remember this phrase? People used to use this all the time in the 1990s. You can say whatever you want about them because they have nowhere else to go. What are they going to do, go and vote for Republicans? We all know that's not going to happen. Now, what's really weird is that eventually this Clintonian tactic became sort of mutated into a full-blown philosophy of governance, okay? You know, body slamming the very people that had just got you elected. And the classic example that I'm referring to here is the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which is highly controversial. Um, it had been uh, 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 proposed, I, I guess, negotiated by George Bush Sr. Now, George Bush's dad was also president. I don't know if you're aware of this. But he had uh, negotiated this treaty with Canada and Mexico. Of course, he couldn't get it through Congress because Congress at the time was controlled by old school Democrats, or, you know, uh, union labor oriented Democrats, and they were like, no way are we going to pass that. So it took a Democrat, it took Bill Clinton coming into office as president to get the, to ram that, that thing through. And he set up a whole war room, you know, he had Rahm Emanuel on the job, and they got it done. They got that thing passed. Now this is very interesting. When he did it, he wasn't just going against or insulting his friends in organized labor. Think about this. He was conniving in their ruin. Okay? He was doing his part to destroy their economic power. He was undermining his own party's greatest traditional ally and ensuring that henceforth in any kind of uh, conflict between management and labor, basically anywhere in the United States, uh, that management would always have the upper hand over labor, right? Because once NAFTA is passed, they can always threaten to move the plant to Mexico. And uh, people have studied this. They started using that threat right away. As soon as NAFTA is passed, it comes out. They start wheeling out. They have the atom bomb now, right? The workers don't. And management uses that every time they can, once NAFTA is passed. And they also sometimes do move the plants to Mexico. Uh, it does happen from time to time. But the threat is the thing. Uh, so what I'm saying is that in getting NAFTA passed, Clinton made the problems of working people materially worse. He didn't just insult them. He made their lives materially worse. Now, NAFTA is fascinating for a historian to go back and read the, about the debate over it because it is as close to a straight-up class issue as we ever have in this country. And it gives us a really good idea, a very good picture of whom our modern Democratic Party means to please, who they care about and who they don't, okay? On the one side of the NAFTA debate, you have uh, professionals and the rich. And they're very much in favor of NAFTA. And you have, on the other side, working people, union members, that kind of thing. They're very much against uh, NAFTA. And it was, as the uh, newspaper, as the journalists at the time uh, often pointed out, it was also an educational divide, the NAFTA divide. It was also an educational divide. People with graduate degrees were on one side. People who hadn't gone to college at all were on the other, right? And you had, at one point, you had all these sort of displays of higher knowledge uh, sort of enacted in favor of NAFTA. There's this moment where you had 283 economists jointly signing a statement about how the treaty is going to, uh, create jobs and increase exports. <laughs> and by, by the way, this happens every time they have a, uh, a, a new free trade treaty. You have this mass signing of, of statements by, uh, by economists. There's one for the TPP. Although uh, with the TPP, it's not uh, economists. I believe it's, uh, uh, what is it? It's like people that work for the State Department or something like that. I've forgotten what it is now. But dipl American diplomats, that's what it is. But you always have this mass signing by authority figures you know, uh, get in your place. We know what's best. You know, that sort of thing. 
Now, hilariously, or uh, that's not the right word, this is a disaster what I'm describing, folks. But, uh, I mean, ironically, uh, the way it worked out is that the predictions of the unlettered blue-collar workers who hadn't gone to college um, turned out to be far closer to what actually you know, happened from NAFTA than did the rosy scenarios of all those economists and the Rhodes Scholar who sat in the Oval Office. Now, this is an interesting point. The New Democrats, who are the, the faction that, uh, that backed Bill Clinton, the, the people that sort of won that democratic civil war that I was describing, New Democrats regarded NAFTA as Clinton's finest moment. They didn't back away from it. They didn't apologize for it. They were like, yes, this is his, this is his great achievement. This is Churchill, you know. This is, this is, a, a, this is his great moment. There's a, a sort of similar uh, view that you, I was you know, reading all these, uh, the, the Clinton literature when I was writing Listen Liberal, and one of the books that I read, a biography of Clinton that came out in 1996, written by a British journalist, had a sort of similar view, uh, was talking about Clinton's achievements. And the author said, uh, yes, Clinton has had a few failings as president, but these are his words. These failings were, in the end, balanced and even outweighed by his part in finally sinking the untenable old consensus of the New Deal and the crafting of a new one. Okay? Now, this is Clinton's admirer speaking. This is his, one of his greatest fans. And why does he love Clinton? Because he killed the New Deal, folks. That's what they liked about him. Okay, that new consensus that, that the author referred to. Who are the heroes? Who are the heroes of this new consensus? Well, the same uh, Democratic Party thinkers who were constantly advising Democrats to abandon workers and abandon the New Deal had the answer. What Democrats had to embrace, they said, was the emerging post-industrial economy. And the people that the Democratic Party needed to identify with were the winners in this new order. Okay? The highly educated professionals who populated our innovative knowledge industries. And when I say professionals, I mean, in a, you know, we have the, the classic five major professionals, lawyers, doctors, uh, you know, uh, clergy, engineers, that sort of thing. But in addition to that, the, the, the population of professionals at this time in the 90s is exploding, right? And so you have people like the math PhDs who write derivative securities on Wall Street. You have the biochemists who make uh, prescription drugs. Now, so this is an enormous group by the 1990s, the professional class. And if you go back and look at the, you know, uh, 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 sort of political science work from the 1950s, these people were, in the Eisenhower years, the most Republican demographic in America. Today, they are the most democratic demographic. They've completely shifted sides. And this uh, really kicks in during the Clinton years. And this is also who the Democratic Party is today. This is really who, what their identity is. They are the party of the highly educated professional class. And the Democrats have other constituencies, to be sure, as we all know, right? Minorities, women, the young. These are the other pieces of, they, they call their, uh, they call it the coalition of the ascendant. But professionals are the group that comes first. Professionals are the ones whose technocratic outlook always prevails in Democratic Party councils. It's their tastes and their manners that are celebrated by liberal newspapers. And it's their particular way of regarding the world that's always taken for granted by liberal politicians as being objectively true. So what I'm saying is that professionals today dominate liberalism and the Democratic Party in the same way that Ivy Leaguers dominate the Obama cabinet. So Democrats nowadays, if you read the party literature, have all of these sort of wonderful, flattering phrases for their uh, favorite demographic. They have these wonderful, uh, you know, uh, these very lovely, very tender terms of endearment. They call these high-achieving professionals the wired workers who will inherit the future. They're supposed to be a learning class that truly gets the power of education. By the way, I really love that one, you know. Some people are in the working class, but other people are in 
the learning class. <laughs> There's a, now you've heard this one. They're a creative class, right, that naturally rebels against fakeness and conformity. They're supposed to be an innovation class that just can't stop coming up with awesome new stuff, right? And, of course, democratic leaders themselves are drawn almost exclusively from the ranks of this uh, very particular social group, right? It's not a coincidence that both Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton for that matter, all of them were sort of plucked from obscurity. If you look at their life trajectory, their biographies are all very similar. They're plucked from obscurity by these very prestigious universities, right? And then the time that they spend at these fancy schools are what defines them as individuals. Think about Bill Clinton, right? He's from Hot Springs, Arkansas, and he goes to Georgetown. He becomes a Rhodes Scholar, right? And the doors of the world swing open for this guy. And he goes to Yale Law School, right? He meets Hillary Clinton at Yale Law School. Or Barack Obama, who goes to uh, Harvard, no, he goes to Columbia and then Harvard Law School and is editor of the Harvard Law Review. And it's the same kind of uh, story, but it's always, right, it's always the, 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 the time that they spend at these fancy universities that allow their personality to unfold and they understand, they come to understand themselves. That. And if you look at the people who advise them at their cabinet choices, it's always the same kind of thing. These highly successful professionals whose worth is established by their achievements in college or graduate school. If you look at uh, the Washington Post periodically runs stories marveling at the educational attainments of Barack Obama's inner circle of advisors. And it's not just that they are Ivy Leaguers. It's Harvard, specifically Harvard and uh, Oxford to some degree. You know, in England, Oxford College. So let me summarize what I've said so far. So this, Democrats have sort of invented this kind of upside-down Marxism where they have a class of winners who are the triumphant heroes of history, right? This class of people who are the heroes of history, they are the winners of our new economic order. They also happen to be the number one constituency of the Democratic Party, and all of our recent Democratic leaders are drawn from the ranks of this very same group. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that this shift of allegiance by the Democrats from the sort of traditional working middle class to professionals, this is what explains so much of what is frustrating about our modern day Democrats. This is what explains the, the problem that I started off with tonight, this vexing question of Obama and the banks. Why is it that the Obama team failed to do what obviously needed to be done with the Wall Street banks? Why did they declare that Wall Street executives were going to be held to a different legal standard than ordinary criminals? And they did. And the guy who said that had to resign the next day, but he said it. Why did Team Obama choose Wall Street over average people again and again and again? <clears throat> because, folks, for the achievement-conscious people who fill the Obama administration, investment bankers are more than friends. These people are peers. These people are classmates. Right? I mean, the, the two groups are essentially the same. They go back and forth through the revolving door the administration, Goldman Sachs, there's no difference, right? Wall Street, they look at Wall Street and they see an industry that is filled with people of subtle minds, sophisticated jargon. Oh, they love that shit, right? So we're not broadcasting this, are we? <laughs> sophisticated, <laughs> sophisticated jargon. We were talking about that this afternoon. They, they just, they, you know, they, they, they just can't. It's so wonderful to hear those, you know, polysyllabic words. They love that stuff. And this, they look at Wall Street and it's like extraordinary innovativeness, right? All the financial innovation. Oh, my God. These are exactly the kind of creative individuals that Democratic Party theory tells us we have to honor and respect, right? They're making these financial instruments that are so admirably complex. So when I, when I was writing this book, so I, I, another Kansan came in here. And I was writing this book, and I, I was showing him what I was working on. And he's an old-school bank regulator. He was a bank regulator back in the 80s. 
He had a hand in prosecuting many, many, many SNL executives in those days. If you're old enough to remember the SNL crisis. And he had a hand in that. And he was, we were talking about this financial complexity. And he said that when he was a regulator, um, and the, you know, he and his old school bank regulators would see undue financial complexity, unnecessary financial complexity. They'd say, aha, right? That's a red flag. They would zero in on that. That's fraud. They're hiding something, okay? Uh, <laughs> for our modern Democrats, they look at financial complexity, and you know what they see, right? Sophistication, right? It's so admirable. They think that stuff is just wonderful. They love it. Right? It's like financial rocket science, as one Obama administration official put it. And by the way, he said that financial rocket science in the course of explaining why they couldn't prosecute these guys. It's, dude, it's financial rocket science. Nobody understands it. Ditto for big pharma, right? So innovative. You can't import generic pharmaceuticals from Canada or India. No, no, no. You have to protect these innovative companies. And folks, Mega dittos for Silicon Valley, right? An industry that can do no wrong in democratic eyes. So lovable, so professional, so creative. I mean, that for this one industry, enforcement of our country's antitrust laws has basically been suspended. Okay? Bow down before Uber, they say, right? That's the company that is rewriting the social contract of this nation. Look, as Secretary of State, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she used to go around the world proselytizing for something that she called Internet freedom. It's, it's weird to me that we're in this presidential campaign. We never debate what Hillary Clinton actually did as Secretary of State. All we talk about is Benghazi. Like, who cares? When she was Secretary of State, she went around the world proselytizing for Internet freedom. What did she mean by Internet freedom? She meant that access to certain Silicon Valley servers... Right? Google, Facebook, was a basic human right. That was the foreign policy of your government, folks. So what does a party of the professional class believe in? What does it look like? Well, the most important item, the number one item on its list of, of uh, you know, on its, in its philosophy is the idea of meritocracy. Okay? Meritocracy. The conviction that uh, the successful deserve their success and that the people who are on top are up there because they are the best. Now, this is the first commandment of the professional class. Everyone gets what they deserve, and what they deserve is defined by how they did in school. Okay? Now, you know this is wrong in a hundred different ways, but where it is wrongest is as a way of taking on the problem of inequality. This is not a doctrine for mitigating inequality. This is a doctrine for rationalizing inequality. This is the exact opposite idea. Folks, there is no solidarity in a meritocracy. Uh, professional class leaders, the people at the very top of the hierarchy, show this incredible deference and respect for one another but they feel precious little sympathy for the you know, less fortunate members of their own disciplines, right? You think about the white-collar workplace. When someone gets fired, their colleagues almost never get together and go on strike or something like that. They always figure, well, he had it coming, right? He, had, he screwed up in some way. Um, I'll tell you my own story. I'm a member of this class. I'm a member of the group that we were talking about. I got a PhD. And when I got a PhD, I went out into the academic job market only to discover that it had been essentially casualized. Right? I went into graduate school in the 80s with this dream that I would be a, uh, you know, a professor like the people that I admired. And I came out of graduate school to discover that, those, that that wasn't on the table any longer, that those jobs were essentially not available anymore. There were a few of them here and there, but not many. And this was happening, this happened to my generation, it happened to the kids that came after us, and it's still happening to this day, uh, right? We all know about this, the adjunct labor. We, we've all read the horrible stories. Have you guys read? You know what I'm talking about, right? The, okay, how much sympathy have they? There still are those uh, tenured professors. There still are, still are, they still exist. 
how bad do you think they feel about what's happened to their own <laughs> kids with PhDs? They don't care. I mean, some of them do here and there. There are some very fine uh, intellectuals and very fine people with tenure. <laughs> You know, and there's many of them here in the audience tonight. There's some great people in academia. But by and large, as a class, they didn't give a damn what was happening. <clears throat> I mean, the fact that life doesn't shower its blessings on people who can't make the grade in the minds of the professional class is not a shock or an injustice, they think. It's the way things ought to be. So look, the story I've told tonight, I know it is a happy and inspiring one. <laughs> That's what I come here to do, to deliver my message of sunshine and uplift. Uh, but if you think about it, I'm, 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 you know, I'm quite serious. This is, think about this. It's, it's, it's almost, the story I'm telling is almost like the coming of the Victorian era once again. This is the coming together of money and merit, okay, of righteousness and success, Okay. I mean, this is the marriage of finance with political virtue, right? And because virtue and righteousness are what being a liberal is all about these days. But in another sense, the transformation of the Democratic Party that I've described has been a disaster. I mean, left parties all over the world were founded about 100 years ago in order to advance the fortunes of working people. That's why they exist. But our left party here in America, one of our two monopoly parties, let us never forget, our, par our left party here in this country has chosen over the last 30 years to turn its back on workers and their, con their concerns and make itself instead into the tribune of the enlightened professional class, this creative class that makes these fine, innovative things like derivative securities and smartphone apps. The working people that the party used to care about, Democrats figured, had nowhere else to go in the famous Clinton-era expression. Well, folks, look where we are today. They have found somewhere else to go. By abandoning these people, Democrats have made inevitable both economic desolation of the kind you see all across the Midwest of this country, as well as a populist backlash against liberalism that has been building slowly for decades. Now, 12 years ago, I described what it looked like out in my home state of Kansas. Well, folks, today it is everywhere. I mean, the backlash is here now, right? Swarming up out of the deindustrialized zone, screaming these bizarre and ugly slogans. Now think about the choice that that leaves us with this year, the awesome choice we've got. Angry right-wing intolerance on one hand and on the other, inequality forever. Folks, there has got to be a better way. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> All right, so there's supposed to be questions. Yeah, so we will take uh, questions um, via Twitter, and I think that Rick has a couple queued up. The TAs also have um, good 3 by 5 index cards and pens for people who'd like to um, write a question out that way. So we will go that way and let Tom drive his own questions. Here. Okay, so we got the first one. What's your advice for old school dams who want to displace the professionals? Man, that's tough. Because it's, it, it feels sometimes like, uh, uh, I went to the Democratic Convention, and uh, you know the first night of the Democratic Convention, they let all the different constituent groups have their moment. And so organized labor comes out there on stage, and you had, uh, 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 you had Trump uh, come out, you had the head of the AFL-CIO, and he gave a speech, and you had the head of the American Federation of Teachers, and she gave a speech. They all got about 10 minutes, and then it went on to the next group, and I forget what it was. You know, maybe it was veterans, I don't know. But, uh, and then, you know, they, then they had a whole parade of different groups, and then they were forgotten. And their issues were forgotten. And at the end of the day, the delegates went out into the parking lot, and there was the Uber tent. The Democrats had struck a deal with Uber to drive the delegates back to their hotels. This is the party of working people has done this, right? And, they, you know, and so the taxi drivers in their union, you know, forget about it. 
This is, uh, we, know where, which, we know which side is in control. And they, uh, you know, they said lots of nice things about the middle class, but up in the skyboxes are all the Wall Street guys, all the private equity guys watching the proceedings, all the Silicon Valley people. You know, they're up there. Um, you know, Eric Schmidt is on some, you know, is always in some kind of, you know, Democratic Party uh, governing committee or whatever he's on these days. Uh, it's very, it's going to be very, very tough to unseat these guys. One of the biggest problems with this group is that they don't, see that there's anything wrong. Everything that I just described tonight is invisible to them. You know, once you factor in the idea of merit and, uh, uh, you know, a hierarchy based on educational status, they, it, it, all, it all crumbles. They're like, well, you know, working class people can't get ahead because they aren't like me. They didn't go to college or they didn't go to graduate school or they didn't get a, uh, a law degree or whatever it is. And so it's very difficult for them to understand the concerns of working people in any way other than just pity. So how do you change it? It, it has to be, uh, it has to be a, a civil war within the party. It has to be. There's no, they're not going to, to just cede ground willingly. And so it has to be a kind of Bernie Sanders style uprising. So one of the uh, things that I described in What's the Matter with Kansas was how the right wing took over the Republican Party in Kansas. Because when I was a kid, it was not a right wing state. It was a, you know, Bob Dole style Republicans, Dwight D. Eisenhower style Republicans. These are very moderate people, ran the Republican Party in Kansas, but they were this kind of people. They were the professional class. You know, they came from certain law firms and they were, you know, they all knew each other and it was a click. And uh, the, you know, these, uh, after, well, it's, it's a long, but to make the long story short, you had a group of working class people, blue collar people in Wichita and in Johnson County who said, you know, we're going to organize and we're going to take over the Republican Party from the bottom up. And here's the crazy thing, folks, they succeeded. Now, their success is disastrous. Look who sits on the throne in, in Topeka now, right? It's, it's just a colossal, you know, it's, it's the, you know, the worst result you could, you could have. But they did it. They threw those, you know, they, they threw the professionals, they took the party away from the professional class, from the ground up. It can be done. So it's a horrible story, but it's also kind of an inspiring story. These are people without resources. This is not the Koch brothers. This is people with nothing managed to do this. It can be done at the state level. You know, it can be done. Frank, listen, God damn it. What do I think of Gary Johnson and the Libertarian Party? I'm... I'm not a big fan of, of libertarians. Okay. Is it even worth pursuing? <laughs> By the way, libertarians, I, 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 you know, I, Washington, libertarians are heavily overrepresented in Washington, D.C. That probably strikes you as odd because it's, the, it's, the, it's not a very libertarian place, right? It's the seat of the federal government, which libertarians despise. But they're all there because they're subsidized. All of these think tanks massively subsidized but people like the Koch brothers, the Koch brothers have three or four of them in D.C., you know. And so there's this, like, all of these libertarian lobbyists and think tanks, and they go on TV all the time. It's really interesting what they've done there. Um, I wrote a book about it. It's called The Wrecking Crew. With all this stuff about libertarians are fascinating people. I also, um, uh, this is actually quite recently, I read Atlas Shrugged. I read the whole thing. Have you guys ever read this book? This is alarming. This is nightmare stuff, you know? Uh, but, you know, it has its merits, too. Okay, what's the next one? Is it even worth pursuing a degree at 43 years old if I don't have one? Oh, Jesus. Well, look, one of the things that they, you know, college is, college is a racket. And I say that as somebody that spent 25 years of my life getting an education, and someone who really believes in education and loves nothing more I would love nothing more than to spend the you know, remaining years of my life in a library somewhere doing research. I love education. But look, they have got the golden ticket to the middle class. And they know it. Now, it's not a sure thing. You're not necessarily, if you get that BA degree, you're not you know, for sure going to be a member of the middle class. But we know totally for sure that you aren't going to be if you don't get one. And they know that, and that's why the price spiral goes up and up and up and up. You know, the economists have a term for this. They're extracting the value. They look at, you know, the, the, how much money you're going to earn over the course of a middle-class life. If you're a success, 
and it's, you know, whatever, a million dollars, you know, and so they say, well, that's, that should be the price tag of a BA. Very rational economic calculation on their part. Look, I am a great believer in, okay, they haven't got to a million dollars yet. I know that. But there's, this is, the, the, your, your libertarian economists will say they have a perfect right to charge more and more and more and more for a BA degree and people, you know, push people deeper and deeper and deeper into debt because that's a very valuable commodity that they happen to be sitting upon. The fact that these happen to these are you know, not-for-profit, supposedly charitable institutions is a detail, and I think an insignificant one in the, in the grand scheme of things. So what's the answer? Yes, you have to get that degree. Uh, there's, no, there's no way around it. But at the same time, look, the situation that we're in with uh, college degrees costing more and more and more every year, this is not sustainable. This can't go on. Uh, I mean, something has, has to happen. And I don't know what it's going to be, but... Uh, it, it has, the system has to break down or be regulated. But this is another place where Barack Obama had many opportunities to intervene and chose not to. Um, you see a pathway towards changing the elitism of the Democratic Party. Oh. Okay, I'm going to skip that one. Who should, <laughs> who should former Bernie supporters turn to in this election? Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'll say, it. frankly, I'm voting for Hillary. I'm not uh, excited to have another Clinton in the White House. In fact, I swore one time I would never vote for another Clinton. And I'm going to, you know, and uh, I feel, you know, I feel bad about it, uh, you know. But Trump frightens me. And, you know, Hillary has adopted a lot of uh, Bernie's ideas. Uh, she at least pays lip service to them. Whether she follows through, I don't think she will. I don't think her heart's in it. Um, she is running as an able technocrat. She is a sort of perfect specimen of the kind of Democrat that I'm talking about. She doesn't have a populist bone in her body. Now, her husband did. Remember, he could turn it on. He could, he could fake it. That guy, was, that guy was kind of awesome back in 1992. You go back and look at the, uh, the, 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 the news footage of Bill Clinton in 1992. But uh, she can't do that. That's not her, that's not her style. But um, I think that... I, I mean, I, ha I have to go with Hillary. Um, but I also think that we have to work within the Democratic Party. Um, let's talk about Trump. Why has nobody asked me about Trump? What with wealthy liberals have to give up? What, what do wealthy liberals have to give up? Because now I'm reading that wrong. It's not scanning. What do you make of the nationalism display at the DNC this year? It was shocking. Uh, so at the Democratic Convention... Uh, Democrats are, they, there's all of these contradictions within the Democratic Party. I've only touched on the, what I think is the central one. But there's numerous uh, uh, other ones. For example, you had all of these people holding signs that say no TPP, you know, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And here comes President Obama, who imagines the TPP is his greatest legacy, right? This is what he wants in the last few months of his presidency. He wants that passed by Congress. And they're, you know, hailing him as, as the greatest president of our time. And, and nobody talks about that contradiction. Or you have Elizabeth Warren gets up and gives a speech, a very good speech about inequality and how awful, you know, Wall Street is and all this stuff. And it's like, well, have you taken a look at your president? <laughs> have, you, have you looked into this? But the, the war stuff was, the, the militarism was fascinating. That uh, at the one time, you, on, on the one hand, you have this obviously very large peace faction in the Democratic Party. Barack Obama ran as the guy who, who thought that the Iraq war was stupid. Uh, Hillary Clinton first became famous in 1969 giving a speech about the Vietnam War. And at this convention, they had this very martial display. There was a, a Marine Corps general who came out with this whole array of soldiers behind him and gave this very stirring kind of you know, speech, like right out of Patton. Remember that? speech in, in Patton, and it was, it was really kind of uh, striking, and there were protesters in the hall chanting things, and, um, but it's, this is Hillary bidding for the, uh, the sort of uh, uh, national security vote that's been alienated by Trump, because he doesn't know what he's talking about, a national security stuff. Everybody can see, you know, the man wants to uh, defund NATO and stuff like that. Everybody can see that, they, you know, the, the hawks are going to be looking for somewhere else to roost, this year, and she, hey, that's a good metaphor, and she wants to, um, you know, make that possible for them, but she's reaching out to all of these traditional Republican constituencies, it's not just the militarists, 
Uh, it's the whole sort of neocons in the foreign policy world. The billionaire class, I just saw Steve Case endorsed her. There's all of these Republican politicians that are endorsed. No, George, uh, George, George Bush Sr., who I referred to earlier, has, uh, said he's going to vote for her. What else have we got? A current PhD student hoping not, not to lose touch with the plight of the adjunct. Used to be one. Um, what can I say? Stick with it. I think the situation can't get worse. <laughs> it's got to turn around. It's, I'm serious. It's, it's got to. Um, but, but let me just say another, another word about that. I mean, I didn't mean to be so bleak and de depressing about that. I mean, it is a bleak and depressing scene, but we are scholars here. And we think about these things in a historical way or in a sociological way or in an objective way. We can take a step back and we can see, and this is an interesting story. I was telling you at lunch today. The, the, uh, if you go back and look at the annals of the Clinton administration, Clinton's right-hand man before he became president was a guy called Robert Reich. Uh, became Secretary of Labor. He's fairly famous today. He's on NPR all the time. He's a very well-known public intellectual. He wrote a book in the early 90s. By the way, and I should just say before I say mean things about him, he's very much changed his tune. And he's a very good guy now, and I really admire him. But he wrote a very popular book in 1991 called The Work of Nations. Where it was one of, it's one of the first big books about inequality. And this, this problem was just then people were starting to notice it, that the you know, the sort of social contract in this country was coming apart. And he wrote this great book about it. And uh, he sort of said a lot of the stuff that I've said tonight, that, you know, the professional class is going to do all right. Working class, you know, traditional people that work in manufacturing are going to disappear. And in the end, you're only going to have two classes, the very well-paid professional class and the uh, people who serve them. Okay? His idea was that we could all become members of the professional class uh, and that the, you know, the, what was happening to the world was totally inevitable. Market forces were destroying uh, blue coat manufacturing workers. There was nothing we could do about that. That was going to happen. We couldn't stop it. We couldn't resist it. But market forces would not touch professionals. Professionals would be fine. Okay? And so if we could all just clamber into that life raft, everything would be great. Okay? And what he didn't foresee at the time was that the forces that were destroying manufacturing workers would come for the professional class as well. And they've come for the PhDs, and they've come for the lawyers, you know, and you go down the list, there's, they've, they've come for uh, engineers, you know. All of these different professions are seeing their own wages being bid down. We're all, we've all been Uberized, or we will be soon. Journalists, Jesus Christ. I mean, look what's happened to my field, you know. Uh, but, no, they saw none of that coming. They said, no, because we have an education, we have advanced degrees, we're protected. We're shielded from the market forces. So these things that are, these terrible things that are happening to blue-collar people, that's going to happen, nothing you can do. But we will be protected. It was just, it was a complete illusion. It was delusional. Sorry, I really got off the point there. What happens to inequality if Trump wins? Huh. Well, I mean, if Trump wins, you know, yeah, more there's, you know, it's, I think it'll, I think it'd be a disaster. The, you know, he, he has said some, look, Trump has been, the reason Trump is riding high is because he's saying the right thing about trade. We all know that. He's, he's, he's got an issue, as they used to say in the 19th century, he's got one issue and he's riding it. And uh, he, you know, in their debate where Hillary trounced him so bad, there was one bright point for him. He spoke, he did a very good job on the trade issue. This is his one selling point. And, uh, you know, he's luring in a lot of, of uh, working class people with his one issue. And they are so excited to get a chance for some payback to the Clintons, you know, for what Bill Clinton did with NAFTA and with PNTR China and that sort of thing. However, when he becomes president, yeah, he may be able to renegotiate NAFTA. In fact, he for sure will be able to renegotiate NAFTA. But he's also going to rewrite the tax code, and he's going to deregulate you know, across the board, and he's going to allow this. And it's basically Paul Ryan will get to do whatever he wants, you know. Uh, and the, that's the scary thing is that the Republican Congress will finally be able to, to get their way, not to mention all the national security issues that, that Trump brings up and the general incompetence. You know, of course, he'll put all his kids in charge of the different departments, you know. Attorney General Trump. Meet Labor Secretary Trump. You know, and, yeah, okay, disaster is what I think.
Um, 2016 is so different from 1980. <laughs> Reality TV, film idol Reagan, whites vote against self-interest. Yes, well, look, it's our times. It's the times we're living in. Uh, or Pat Buchanan, who's another TV star who ran a very similar issue in uh, 92 and 96. Or I think the, the, one of the great comparisons, who was that congressman from Youngstown, Ohio? He was a Democrat. His name was Trafficant, James Trafficant. Remember this guy? He was a working class hero. He finally went to prison, I believe, for being mobbed up. You know, <laughs> It was really bad news. But they loved him in Youngstown. You know, it's that, that's the kind of situation that you're looking at with Trump. Um, what do I make of his hair? I kind of admire it. <laughs> Why were millennials' voices ignored and mocked in this election cycle? That's an excellent point. Uh, a lot of my uh, left-wing friends you know, are always saying millennials are the new working class. This is the new, this is the new proletariat. You know, these are people who are seeing the, what they were promised evaporate before their eyes, and they, you know, they've gone into debt to go to college, and they get out of college and they discover that all, jo like, like me, coming out and discovering that academic labor has been casualized, that everything has been casualized, and they are a screwed generation. And they have every right, in my view, to be pissed off about it. And uh, this is, I mean, so you're, look, you're mainstream centrist Democrats, uh, have to brush that challenge off somehow. So how do they do it? Of course, they're young. They don't know what they're talking about. You saw Hillary's remarks, contemptuous remarks about them living in their parents' basement, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, there's, it, it, I was actually um, planning on writing an essay about that somewhere, you know, one of these days. I'm running out of time before the election is over. But, the, you know, to pile up the evidence of this, the way that Democrats tried to stigmatize an entire generation that they're now counting upon Right, to deliver the White House to Hillary. What media sources do I trust? Well, that's good. Was oh, that Lisa? Lisa asked me that? Yeah. <laughs> um, I read the New York Times and Washington Post every day. Uh, I can't say I trust everything in them. Well, the New York Times, by the way, this is a fascinating election year for uh, uh, media watchers, you know. If you believe in the you know, liberal media conspiracy, they're right out. Of, they're right. Out, they're wide. Out, they're open about it now. I mean, the, the New York Times ran a front-page essay by Jim Rutenberg about how you know it's the media's responsibility to stop Trump. And so, yeah, they're they're uh, you know they're writing their stories differently. But they also did it to Bernie. The interesting thing is they also treated Bernie this way. I just finished writing a story for Harper's. It will be out uh, in a couple weeks here about the way the Washington Post treated Bernie Sanders. It's unbelievable. When you go back and look at the hailstorm of hate that they rained down on this man, and it, like insulting headlines, you know. And this is even in the news, this is also mainly in the opinions and the blog uh, pages. The Post has all these blog pages now. But it's also in the news reporting. And the New York Times has been particularly bad in this regard. It's Absolutely fascinating. So the, the problem is, who do I trust? <sighs> Look, all my life I brushed off the, uh, uh, the criticism of the liberal media. I never took it seriously. I mean, we ran essays in The Bachelor about uh, what a joke it was, you know. And uh, I always laughed at it. And, and now, I mean, they're right out there out in the open saying this is what they're doing. And uh, I've never really um, thought about who, who I should trust. Who else do I read? Well, you know, speaking as a journalist, so when I write a story, I generally try to make sure that I have the facts right. So I, I try to be very responsible about that. Now, I, as you guys know, I have very strong opinions. No, I, I'm totally objective uh, all the time, and I, I never exaggerated a story. But, okay, I do all that stuff, but I always make sure that at the heart of it is that I've got the facts right. You've got to have the facts right, otherwise you're going to like you're gonna look like a fool. And... Uh, so I, you know, I check everything that, that, I'm, that I'm saying, and I try to make sure that I get it right. But that's something that, that I personally do. I don't know what, where to send you. I would just say read more than one story. And uh, I have, I mean, I, I really dislike the right-wing media, really dislike them, but uh, uh, they've had a lot of stories in this cycle that the liberal, that the, you know, the, the Post and the Times are not reporting on, which is kind of shocking to me. Um, I also, I, look, I do, the Wall Street Journal is an excellent newspaper. The op-ed pages are very slanted. 
I used to write for them. You guys don't know that. I used to, I was the liberal columnist at the Wall Street Journal. Yes, but it's, it's some of the most excellent reporting you'll, you'll ever find anywhere in the world. I mean, they are first rate. They're absolutely the best. Okay, what else? Would a $15 minimum wage hurt more than help? No, it would help more than hurt. I mean, this is economists debate this all the time. If you jack up minimum wages too high, you'll chase all the jobs away, and you know they'll replace the people at Wendy's with uh, robots or something like that. But I think in the grand scheme of things, in the broad scheme of things, it'll probably help more. I think it probably ought to be left up to uh, uh, states and local areas, though, because not everybody can afford the same. You know, it shouldn't be just universal, but it should definitely be higher than it was. You know, the last president to get the minimum wage raised, you know who it was? It was Bush. Okay, next. How have we, the people, contributed to our own situation? Okay, I'm skipping that one. <laughs> it's all we, the people. You know, it's all us. This is democracy. But the thing is, you have a democracy of 300 million people now. You know, it is so hard to get your hands around anything or to start it, to run a national movement, to do anything without money, you know. And so it's, in some ways, you, you, you start to wonder if it's even possible to have a democracy with that many people in it. Okay, I don't get the other one. Okay. You guys can just call things out. You know, high tech is failing us again, folks. <laughs> you know, there's some billionaire in Silicon Valley is choosing what to, what to, what to go out there, you know. Yeah, oh, where's the cards? Oh, you are? Oh, you're typing them in? Yeah, I can read. I can read. It was my dream candidate. Is, is uh, Trump's populist politics throughout strategic or accidental? That's a really good question. How did Trump happen on his issue? How did Trump figure it out? Because this does show a kind of genius. I, I think this guy is like a fool in all sorts of ways, but, but uh, he did figure out the perfect way to attack the Democrats and to rally these voters. Uh, the white working class voters who had been lured into the Republican Party with the culture war issues and then give them something that really matters to them and something that's going to be very hard for a Clinton, specifically a Clinton, to get out of, which is the trade issue. That was kind of clever. That was a kind of, and the Democrats didn't see it coming at all, you know. They're totally in denial about the trade issue. So I live among these people in Washington, D.C. They, you know, they, they, uh, they, for years, they just brush off any criticism of NAFTA. You know, that's just that's, that's stupid xenophobia. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. It created more jobs. You know, they have all of these excuses, all of these ways of closing their eyes <coughs> to what the trade deals have, have done and how they've been negotiated. And he just totally caught the blindsided on that. And so did Bernie. My dream presidential candidate. You know, I like Sherrod Brown. I think he's awesome, the senator from Ohio. I, I thought, uh, before all of this began, I thought this was Elizabeth Warren's year. Had she run, there, no one would have been able to stop her. She was, she's a fantastic, uh, would have made a fantastic candidate. And Bernie, I believe, only ran because she didn't. <clears throat> Anyhow, that's my opinion. Um, the voice is fading here. Mm. But I liked Bernie. I thought he was all right. And it's amazing to me that he went as far as he did. I mean, people thought he's just the Kucinich of 2016. And look what this guy did. I mean, he almost uh, overturned the whole damn machine. Here, I'll read one. Uh, many scholarly, quote, professionals argue that white working class switched to Republicans under Reagan. That is, before the Clinton administration. Does this contradict your claim that it was Bill Clinton that lost the working class for Democrats? Well, it's been, it's been a, I think it's been a, a gradual transition. Yeah, of course, Reagan was, it started under, it actually started earlier, it started under Nixon. So, it, listen, liberal starts in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. And what you have at that time are two simultaneous things. The Republican Party developed something called the Southern Strategy. You, you've heard of this, where they're going to reach out to Wallace voters. So, uh, George Wallace was a open segregationist who ran for president in 1968 and uh, won the electoral votes of all the southern states, or a bunch of the southern states. And um, these were states that had formerly been Democratic. And uh, the Republicans took one look at this and were like, hey, we can win that stuff. You know, all we, and this is, this is the origin of sort of dog whistle politics and all that sort of thing. If we can make these kind of coded appeals to uh, uh, racist white voters in the South, we can win uh, the southern states and 
you know, get this lock on the presidency, and they, they did it, and it worked. And that was really the beginning of all of this, this movement. And Nixon's, of course, his appeal to the same phrase that Trump likes to use, the uh, silent majority, you know, the people who weren't protesting against the Vietnam War, that kind of thing. At the very same time, Democrats, this is when Democrats were deciding to close organized labor out of the party. And it was the, the issue for them was the Vietnam War. The organized labor had, a lot of unions had supported uh, Johnson on the Vietnam War. And so the Democrats, after the 68 convention, sat down and reformed the Democratic Party. They did a lot of good things, a lot of healthy things, but they also uh, decided to sort of remove organized labor from its structural position in the party. And so all of these things happen and reach out to professionals. And that's, of course, they called them suburban liberals at the time. This is the group that McGovern then <laughs> won over in this big way in 1972, this sort of catastrophic election of 1972, where George McGovern wins one state. Remember this? Massachusetts. Because he totally romps among the uh, white-collar, affluent white-collar professional demographic. Anyhow, so the two things happen at the same time. And they get bigger and bigger and worse and worse. And it gets worse under Reagan, and it gets worse under Clinton, and it got worse under Bush. And uh, I have a French uh, friend and editor of a paper that is the last thing I'm going to say. And he comes over here every four years. We went to the conventions together. He comes over here every four years. And after I wrote What's the Matter with Kansas, he said, I want to write a story like that for my newspaper. So take me to a place where I can see this happening. And we went to West Virginia. We got in the car and drove up to West Virginia. West Virginia, as recently as 1988, was profoundly democratic. It went for Dukakis, like one of the like, three or four states that he won. No, not four. What was it? It wasn't very many, but it was one of the states that he won. And they were, you know, really identified with the Democratic Party. And this year, that's one of the states that Trump is not just going to win, but Trump is going to win that state by a lot. And this is a place that's, you know, been in transition for some time. And, you know, we, so this French guy and I drove all around West Virginia interviewing people and reading the local newspapers and talking to people about this stuff. And he said, uh, my French friend had a saying, he, you know, says, I come over here every four years, and every four years, it's a little bit worse. <laughs> uh, okay, that's it. Let's try some more. So as I said, uh, we have books outside. Tom will be making his way out. And oh, is that you want me to stand out there? Yeah, it's up there. Okay. Uh, and just join me again in thanking Tom Frank for a superb evening.